everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Right. Thank you for coming out this morning. Uh, my name is Brenton Brown. I am the Chief of Staff here at the Commission for Minority Affairs. I want to bring you greetings this morning on behalf of our Executive Director, who could not be here, Dr. Dolores DaCosta. Uh, if you know Dr. DaCosta, she's typically all over the state. Um, so I think she was in Georgetown a couple days ago, uh, Edgefield, and I'm not sure where in the state she is right now. but. Um, if she were here in Columbia, she would definitely be here. Um, but on her behalf and her absence, I extend her thoughts and thank you all for coming here. Also extend the thoughts of our Board of Commissioners who could not be here on today. Um, have a few remarks of welcome and then we'll get started with our roundtable. Um, as I mentioned to you, my name is Brenton Brown, I'm Chief of Staff, and I come before you wearing two hats. Uh, first, as one of the agency executives, I'm extremely proud of the staff and the team at CMA and all the great work that they are doing across the state of South Carolina for our minority communities, making sure that we have the resources that we need. But I think for today, uh, most importantly, I come to you with a second hat, and that is as a bibliophile or a reader. And if you know me, if you come into my office, um, you know, or go into my home, I have books everywhere. And I couldn't have books to read we didn't have authors to write them. And so today is especially important to me because personally, I love reading. I love the art of reading. I love reading things that are new. I love reading things that are creative. I love reading fiction and nonfiction and creative nonfiction and a whole bunch of different genres. So I want to welcome you all here on today. There's a quote when I was looking up. Um, I don't like speaking in front of people, even though they ask me too long time. It's not, it's not my cup of tea. Um, but I think the words of, of inarguably the greatest American writer who ever lived, uh, the late Miss Toni Morrison probably says it best when she talks about why she wrote it. She said, I wrote my first book because I wanted to read it and it had never existed seriously in literature. Since I couldn't find a book that I thought, since I couldn't find a book that did that, I thought, well, I'll write it and then I'll read it. It was really the reading impulse that got me into the writing thing. And so I believe that's why we're all here today. In some way, shape, form, or fashion, we love books, we're readers, and we want to share the gifts that you all have with the world. So once again, thank you. Um, if there's anything that we can do here at CMA, whether it's on today or in the future, do not hesitate to reach out to us. I want to thank all of our panelists for offering their time and their expertise on today. Thank you all for coming out. And we hope that this yields some very great fruits in the future for South Carolina. Thank you. Islander Program Coordinator at the Commission, um, and I will be one of the moderators today with my good friend, Ashley Owens, and I am the African American Affairs Program Coordinator at the Commission. And we're just going to hand this on the line if you guys want to introduce yourselves and maybe give us some of the titles of the books. So I am Shaquana Tilly. I am an author and illustrator. I'm also the owner of Tiffany Purple LLC. Uh, so I have a Bachelor of Science in Early Childhood Education and a Master's in the Leadership of Educational Organizations. I have helped to uh, other authors to actually illustrate and publish their own books. And I have over 12 titles now. And today I have with me uh, two of my first books that I created, uh, Believe and I Believe Too. So those are books about positive affirmations as well. Awesome. Love it. Hi, everyone. Grateful to be here. I am Carson Faust. Um, I am an author of two forthcoming books, uh, tentatively titled <coughs> Living Hot the Dead and A Bible of the Night, as well as a contributor to uh, a dark Native American fiction anthology called Never Whistle at Night. Um, uh, I'm an enrolled member of the Edison that just moves to Travis, South Carolina, and yeah, great to be here. Good morning, my name is Linda Green. I am an author and an herbalist, and most of all, I'm a mother. I am the business owner of Divine Intervention. And I do consulting, um, educating people on what to eat, how to eat, crisis, um, grief crisis, and as well as life coaching. And this is my first book, which is If You Love Me by Linda Renee. And I just finished my second book on Saturday. Let me hear you say Talofa. Talofa. All right. So Talofa is hello in my Samoan language. And I want to say Talofa to all of you. Thank you for being here. 
So my name is Papi Pele Hunkin, but I go by Pele for short, which means uh, sweetheart in my Samoan language. And so I am the author of Heart of a Warrior, The Humble Journey of a Samoan Warrior. I'm working, currently working on my second book, That Kept My Heart Alive, A Story of Love, Faith, and Survival. I am a mother of five, a granddaughter of one, and a fur baby dog, Debo. I'm an uh, Army retired uh, combat veteran, and so I am truly honored grateful and blessed to be here and so thank you good morning world good morning. <laughs> um, i'm nina love and i am a publisher i'm the owner of two feet production we're a multimedia company currently we help authors uh, publish their own work we don't we're not a traditional publishing firm in that we don't want any rights to your books we just want to help you uh, change the narrative in the world by producing your own work, writing your own things, writing characters or telling stories of people that look like you, that act like you, that talk like you. Because just like the quote, his quote was so appropriate in the beginning about Toni Morrison writing the story that she wanted to read. And that's how I got into writing. I'm also a lifelong journalist. I think I have over a hundred journals that I've written in over my lifetime. So I really believe in documenting your life, telling your own story, and uh, that's what our business at 2 Productions does to help people publish their own work, where you keep 100% creative. Uh, the creative process belongs to you. All of the copyright belongs to you. We just want to help you on your journey and infuse the world with your stories. Thank you. Good morning. So, Good morning. So glad to be here. My name is Dr. Walter B. Curry Jr. I'm the founder of Renaissance Publication LLC, a self publishing company where I publish my books in African American history and genealogy. Uh, I am an educator, um, an author, and uh, I publish two award winning books that focuses on my family history through African American history, local history in South Carolina. Um, the Thompson family all told stories from the past 1830 to 1960 that goes from slavery to the Civil War, the Reconstruction era, focusing on my ancestral experiences, and the awakening to C. Wright Ellison um, family saga, volume one, a narrative history um, that covers the same topics that relates to my ancestry. And so um, I also do historical exhibitions. Um, I have a grant with the Sci Fi Arts Commission uh, where I partner with the Aiken Center for the Arts, where the bulk of my work um, is there, and where we go into the middle schools and high schools uh, where I set up historical exhibitions for eighth grade and 11th grade um, social study classes, focusing on the standards. And so we have expanded this year um, into other schools across South Carolina. I'm also a member of the South Carolina uh, Speakers Bureau um, from the organization South Carolina Humanities. And so I do all of that, and I also do volunteer work in historical preservation as well and help individuals who are interested in publishing their family history. So I'm glad to be here and thank you all for coming and so glad to be here with my fellow authors. Buenos dias. My name is Juan Gonzalez, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I come from Gringo. Uh, I'm originally from Mexico. I, I came here uh, to school a long time ago, back in 93 to Clemson University. Um, I guess by one of those things of life that brought me here to South Carolina, which I love this state. Um, we've been promoting literature in the community of Greenville for the last 10 years. Uh, we've been uh, promoting uh, everybody's books except mine. <laughs> and um, until now, then we have this series called Raices, uh, which means roots. And this is the first of 20. Uh, the small books, and uh, this one is in print at this moment, is uh, Gloria. And this series of books <clears throat> is aimed for youth, uh, for them to find meaning in life, for them to learn about, about other cultures, and um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much.
right, so now we're going to get into the panel discussion um, of the program. And so we're going to we're going to pass the mic to Christine. Okay, great. So as you guys can see, we have a very diverse panel. So I'm very excited to hear um, everyone's writing styles and kind of their journey through the writing process and publishing. Um, so we're going to start with Carson. Um, how has your cultural background influenced your writing style and themes um, that you can explore in your work? Yeah, I mean, I would say, so, um, I don't know, I guess my, my native roots come from my, my dad's side from his mother, so my grandma. Um, and I've always thought of, you know, she likes to tell what I call ghost stories. So she is she feels very connected to her relatives, very connected to you know, the places she would live. And even as people pass on, she talks as if they're still there. Um, uh, and to me, like I find that comforting to in the grand scheme of publishing itself. Um, you know, that's called horror. <laughs> you know, talking to people who uh, you know aren't here anymore. Um, so uh, that that's kind of the the foundation from which I write from, and I'm just also I've always just been creepy. Like I, <laughs> I, I am. I have always enjoyed like uh, you know, you know. I would read like uh, scary stories to tell in the dark, which was like a children's book in the in the nineties, um, and you know, then that led to like you know sneaking horror movies into the house, even though my mother was not a huge fan. Um, and there's all these kind of like parts of my identity that just came from what felt like rebellion, uh, which then became part of writing. Um, and kind of tied to how my grandma talked about the past, um, I've always been interested in how, you know, ghosts can help us un uh, un or resurface things that uh, have been either hidden from us or hidden from society. Um, and like as an indigenous person in a, from a tribe that is not very well known, I, I, I almost view it as like my purpose or job um, to, to get those stories out there. Um, so, you know, I think uh, that quote that was shared earlier about like, you know, if there are stories that don't exist that you would like to read, like they have to come from you. Um, uh, and, you know, I would also say in terms of navigating through um, the you know, publishing world, um, I think self-belief is the most important part. And then as you use that self-belief to craft the things you want to see in the world, uh, you also have to find folks that believe in you. Um, so I can just, should I also talk about like my journey to publishing, or is that later? Yeah, no, I would love to know, have you faced any unique challenges yeah. or been offered any opportunities as a Native American author? Uh, yeah, good question. I mean, I would say, <laughs> um, you know, I think it's pretty obvious when you look at the vast majority of bookshelves in stores and also, you know, libraries, like, Native stories are not as common as others. Uh, so that's always a challenge. Um, and I'll share, you know, I, I actually went through like the more traditional, quote unquote, uh, uh, aspects of publishing. Um, so uh, with my agent last year, I went out on submission with the two books I, that are forthcoming. Um, and I got a lot of pushback from editors um, saying like, oh, like, we really liked your writing, we really liked this story, but we actually like already have a native author who we published last year. Um, so this is not the right time for your, I'm like, okay, well, one. <laughs> um, so <laughs> there's definitely, and I think this might be shared across the room, and that's why I'm so, um, I admire so much kind of the folks who like work in publishing on, at this table who uh, take it upon themselves to to see the gaps that like traditional publishing uh, has, um, and be advocates for for stories that you know need to be out there and need uh, there there are voices out there to tell those stories. There just need to be people who believe that those stories need to be seen, uh, which is very often a primary issue. Um, so yeah, I would say the most of the challenge is like you know um, there is this misconception that like, oh, like, there's never been a better time to be like a BIPOC author than right now because there's so much more hunger for, but, but, but 
Just because some of us are being published does not mean we are being represented uh, equally across the playing field in the world of publishing. Uh, I'm grateful that like so many people, like Tony Morrison, who you mentioned, like began uh, that movement. Uh, but there's so much more to be had. And, um, yeah, I guess that's it for now. Thank you, person. Yeah, we'll circle back to you later. Oh, <laughs> 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 All right. So, um, Kelly, this question is for you. Um, you mentioned that you, uh, I guess, started out as an illustrator. Um, so where did that passion, when did you discover that passion, and did that lead you down the path of becoming an author? Um, so I uh, have been illustrating since uh, maybe I could color. I mean, let me see, maybe since the age of three. Everything that my mom got me for Christmas centered around, you know, either crayons or coloring pencils or coloring books, something that was creative. Um, so I started with the illustration process um, many years ago, many moons ago. Um, I was um, when I would be in class and I would finish my work early. I would get out my journal and I would start writing, and then I would illustrate a story to go along with my uh, whatever story that I wrote as well. So it's been a, a long process, but in 2017, uh, I ventured out with my best friend. I was like, let's create a children's book. Like, let's do that. I've always wanted to do a children's book. Like, let's write together because we both are educators. Um, so we started the process of creating Zoe's World, Search for the Perfect Snack. Um, and um, I say, okay, we'll collaborate on doing the story together, and then I'll do the illustrations. So that's what we did, um, and it's been um, up from there since. I've been able to, like I said, illustrate over 12 books, and I've also been able to help at least, um, I think, four different individuals self-publish and illustrate their books as well. So I love doing it. I wanted to create characters that look like me, and also look like my nieces and nephews because I don't see a lot of that. So I just like, especially like little dark skinned girls like me. So I wanted to create those um, characters that look like me and represented me and a healthy individual, as you stated, with your publishing company. Um, if they wanted to create characters that look like themselves or their, their family and their friends, that they had that opportunity as well. So that's what I wanted to do. Awesome, awesome. Can you tell us about your um, experience of getting your first book published and kind of what was the biggest lesson you learned? Okay, so in 2017, uh, YouTube and uh, I guess now like the social media, how everybody is saying like how they're doing their self-publishing, uh, that did not exist as much when I started. And I was just like, oh, but I'm up for the challenge. So I was like, I gotta research. And I mean, when I told you I was researching and trying to talk to everyone about like, how did you start your journey? How, how do you go about doing this? And it wasn't a lot of information out there. So I was just like, okay, I was up for the challenge. So I, when I tell you, I months probably trying to research and figure out how do I do this because I wasn't going to let that defeat me. So I figured it out and I'm happy that I went through that process because now I'm able to help other individuals in that journey as well. Mm -hmm. So I started the the process with, I go through Amazon KDP and I, as I stated at the time, there wasn't a lot of information about it. And then I figured it out and I was just like, okay, I got this information. And um, my parents always told me, once you have it, nobody can take it away from you. So I'm able to share that information with others. certain chronic illnesses and my motto is prevention instead of the cure so if you start educating people on what they can and should not do or should not eat then you, you don't have to worry about getting to the stages of di being a diabetic cancer and all that and by doing that and then hear from my mom she was diagnosed with cancer and then my grandmother I'm like oh my gosh so you know then I, I started thinking like you know even though I see the pain I also saw the bravery that they had um, fighting this, going through radiation and chemo. My mom had um, 18 weeks of radiation, five days a week, you know, and then she had to go into chemo. I'm like, you know, her script had actually been the thing that I beat on then and even now, even though I lost her three years ago. And that's when I started to think about writing my book, you know, and 
and it came from her strength and my strength is like okay i need to get out and tell this story uh if you love me the title is very misleading so you have to read the book to find out what's it, what it is about and and that gave me the strength to go ahead and write this book um i battled with it for a while because i knew that i was putting myself out there you know i was like letting everything go being raw you know it's like okay everything that happened from the age of five up until the age of 28 and you know i'm like okay if they endure all this pain from the radiation and cancer then i can endure and be unapologetic on what i write about um, do you think um being an african-american woman played a factor in any challenges you may have faced as far as writing your book or being published um, well, I just love publishing. Um, some of it, it has, uh, because there have been times that I was faced with some issue because of me being African American and that I wasn't awarded to get the help that I needed or um, the information, you know, if I go to this person, well, no, I don't know anything about it, but in turn, you already published seven or eight books. So, you know, it's like I am a firm believer from what my mom taught us being a single mother raising four, that whatever knowledge that you can share with other people, then share it. You know, you find people who's to be a crab in a bucket, you know, and those type of people, you have to learn how to capitalize them and put them in a place, but don't allow that to dictate you or stop you from what you want to accomplish in life. And the color of my skin did not stop me. Even though I was growing up in the South, and my mom, she faced a lot of challenges growing up in the South, you know, being African American. I mean, you, you were entitled not to do this, not to do that. You were placed in a stereotype, like, you know what, you can't fit in because of the color of your skin or the texture of your hair. And not, you know what, I'm gonna break those barriers. And, and that's really started me thinking ever since I was a child. It's like, you know what, I can't play with Susie because her mom doesn't want me to be with her because I'm African American. And, you know, she's Caucasian. Okay, then that's, that's fine. But, you know, it, it started with the parents. You gotta look beyond the color. Whenever we cut, we all bleed the same color. So, you know, you gotta educate people, you know, don't allow the color of your skin to make you feel like you're better than anyone else. Whether you, even though you're African American, you're brown, you're dark, it doesn't matter. I mean, to me, it doesn't matter what color you are. If I can help you, I'm gonna help you. And that's where my mom raised us. Um, so you are someone who wrote autobiography. Um, can you tell us about what what inspired you to tell your story? And then also, were you scared at all for an autobiography to have your friends and family read about some of the trials and tribulations that you've been through? Yes, thank you. So what inspired me to write this book, Heart of a Warrior, The Humble Journey of a Samba Warrior, is because I believe that my story would be a blueprint for somebody else's life. And I wanted others to know that, you know, they have a voice, you know, their voice matters, their story matters. And um, can I share real quick what um, the work author has meant for me after writing this book? So the letter A for author, we all have a higher power. So the A was, um, you know, I always allow God to be the uh, cornerstone of my life and everything that I've been through. And the you for me was my unwavering faith in God, myself, and just trusting the process of, you know, writing um, this book. And the T is time. And I want to encourage each and every one of you, now is the time. You know, that's why I had to tell myself, like, you know, now is the time for you to tell your story. You know, tell... Um, that story and share God's story. How did you get to where you are today? And to use all that gift, the talents, and all the blessings that God has blessed you with, I want you to know that now is your time to birth that book. And so the age was humble, and I'm grateful to my mother and my grandmother. They've always instilled in me and my 12 other siblings that a humble heart will take you a long way in life. And so the O was my obedience to God's calling in my life. We all have a calling. You will know that calling. And so I just encourage you to do that, you know, to be obedient to your calling and be a blessing to other people. So that, that was that O for me. I wanted to be that blessing to other people, to be an inspiration and empowerment. And so the R was that reset button. There was a time in my journey where I didn't want to uh, to continue on, you know, writing this book. 
And so it was okay to to reach out to my publisher and say, hey, you know, I want to write this book with all of my heart and with all of my love because this is what my mom has instilled in me. And so it's okay to restart. It's okay to say, you know, now it's not the time. So I was in a 90 day, um, yeah, it was a 90 day book challenge. And, it, and that's how long it took me um, to write the manuscript for my book. But it took me a whole year to press that publish button, you know, with them, and it's okay. And so uh, that's what inspired me is uh, sharing my story. And I wanted to leave that legacy, a legacy of love, a legacy of courage for my children, you know, my grandchildren, and for the people, the amazing people that God has placed in my life. And if that, what was that other question? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. What, would you like to talk about um, the publishing process for you? Because um, I know you kind of want a more traditional route, and you've had some wonderful opportunities with your publishers. Do you want to tell us about that? Yes. So I went all the way to Manchester United Kingdom. That's where my publisher uh, is from. And I have met um, Tanya Coley through a speaking uh, training with um, the uh, renowned uh, Les Brown. So we were all in a speaking class uh, training um, with Les Brown. And so that's where um, I reached out to Tanya Coley. And so, yeah, um, it was challenging. I must say uh, it was very challenging for me because um, I was going through, you know, some challenges of life. And, you know, just like Sister Green, you know, she didn't let the color of her, uh, of her skin stop her. And so I didn't allow the challenges of life. I didn't allow, you know, my past and everything behind me, but to push forward because I had that goal. I had that, you know, that vision that, you know, I, I wanted to be, you know, that inspiration and to be that empowerment to other people. And I want them, you know, to write their story because, you know, your story matters and your voice matters. And I always want you to know that. And so, um, Going through with uh, the publishing, it was an amazing um, journey, and there were times where I can, uh, you know, share with the publishers that there were times where the editing, you know, portion is like they try to they edit your book, but when you get it back, you're like, ah, uh, this is not what I, you know, right? Yeah. Yes. Never. <laughs> yeah, and so I so I just encourage you when you do go through that, you know, always make sure that it's your voice. You know, anyone can always, you know, turn your story into like theirs, but just fight for yours. It's your story. So own your story, and so um, that's that's the the process of you know being an author, and you know your book will travel. You know, will take you places that you never um, thought you would. And um, it has taken me, I was in um, the UK uh, recording my audio book and launched my, my very first uh, in-person launching for my 50th birthday. And I'm grateful to God for making all that happen. And I want y'all to believe that dreams do come true. And this was one of my dreams to be that author and so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amen. And we're going to go down to one at the end. We're going to circle back to the publishers. Thank you. Thank you all. So, um, what obstacles did you have to overcome as an Hispanic author in South Carolina? Um, obstacles. <clears throat> so me personally, uh, since I'm, I'm a very busy person, like, you know, I have several businesses and and I always wanted to publish my content and I've had time and um, my my family took priority priority over publishing and I uh, just kept, uh, kept putting it off and so that's that's been one of the challenges and uh, to basically to decide which which are you going to um, to bring to read, to, to which where you're going to dedicate your time and and and, uh, and uh, your mind, and uh, for me, has always been my my, my children. Um, but this book is also my children, my child, and um, I always wonder, uh, you know, philosophically, what for? If it's really more like 
my time, and because it's not very uh, profitable business-wise, but I had this fire to communicate some things. Um, so I just like you know kept uh, pushing and making meetings. That, that has been one of the things that has has worked for me to make meetings with people that can contribute to the to the book, and that kept me, kept me uh, better organized towards my goal. Um, so um, organization and time was one of the challenges, and I overcame it. Overcame those with meetings, uh, make meetings with people that can help and um, can bring something to the, to the table. This uh, book was illustrated by um, an, art, an artist. He was not the first artist that I, came, that I interviewed because um, it was a challenge to get to the right point of color and uh, expression. <clears throat> and, but after, you know, it was a big day when I, when I got to, um, with this artist and we agreed to a prize for, for, for Per, per, um, per drawing, per, per picture, and we start working on it slowly, and back and forth, one single picture back and forth several times, and another picture back and forth, and so on and so forth. So it was kind of uh, time consuming, um, and at that time I didn't have. So, uh, but you know, uh, this person helped me with these uh, uh, illustrations, and I mean this artist, and a good friend, and that's how it start everything coming together. So it's not uh, one day, day to the next, but it was more of a perseverance challenge. Awesome. Oh, I have one more question. Um, can you um, expound a little more about the Spanish writer group that you founded in Greenville and how that came about? The Spanish writers um, <clears throat> is a community group that uses literature to mostly to be sensitive to the social issues. Uh, one of them has been, for example, uh, youth, the depression in youth, which is one of the things that moves us to write something or do something. Or you know what is literature for if we cannot solve something of, of concern? Um, not for that I want to express something, but you know, if, what can we do to help uh, a, young, a young guy in depression? So Spanish writers uh, set sets up contests. You know that one was called um, literary hugs, which was basically an invitation to write poetry and essays and short stories related to how could you help somebody going through a difficult time. And it's not very easy. It's a very special type of leadership that that we that sometimes is not very common to see. Very subtle. Very very special. Uh, so Spanish writers is is been in existence for ten years and is um, uh, helping um, uh, build bridges through through ideas. There is um, uh, people that uh, are you know factory workers that for a long time haven't been able to have a way to express what they what they write. And Spanish writers welcome their ideas. Uh, there are um, college teachers that would like for their students to learn about, uh, you know, what's our culture like, and we present these showcases into the community, to the universities. So it's uh, we have a Facebook page. If you guys want to follow us, it's a bilingual uh, page, and there is uh, great writers in Spanish writers. What's the Facebook page called? Uh, the, the Facebook page is uh, Spanish Writers. Okay. And uh, the mission states to promote intercultural innovation through creative writing and community collaborations. The Spanish Writers is the first um, writers group of Hispanic origins in South Carolina. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to move on to our, our publishers now. Um, this is going to be addressed to both of you, so either of you can answer first, but what inspired you guys to become publishers, and then what are you looking for um, in an author um, to publish this? Um, my company, uh, Renaissance Publications, um, I was inspired through the entrepreneurship 
a legacy on my mom and dad's side. Um, and the reason why I started my publication company because it was told um, because of the success of my first book um, to file an LLC so you could be formalized um, as um, not only as an author but also as a business. Um, and so I'm a firm believer that authors should think of themselves as entrepreneurs because you want to get paid in doing this. Um, you have the creative side, but you also have um, the business side. And you will see um, when you set yourself up, um, whether it's an LLC or uh, Inc. Incorporated, that the business side of uh, writing has enormous benefits. Um, I don't uh, publish books for others. Um, however, I do provide um, consultation. Um, I share my strategies and tips to encourage people, to help people. Um, things that I've done as far as African-American research, um, genealogy, family history, or interviews and so forth. And I'm also connected um, to several historical um, societies, genealogical societies across South Carolina. And those societies and organizations have resources as well. And so um, I am exploring at some point to um, publish books for um, authors. Um, I'm still looking into that. Uh, however, I do have a presentation to help people get started in publishing um, their family history. And so um, I take great pride in uh, presenting um, that topic for people who are interested. Thank you. Same question? Yeah. Um, what, what inspired you um, to, to publish and what do you look for in other people's stories um, as a publisher? Um, <clears throat> and the, the main search is meaning. Uh, meaning means for us, it's a big word for us because it brings another perspective to the table. Um, <coughs> this, uh, this short story, for example, Gloria, which is in print right now, is a, a typical lady from Mexico who lives in very rural areas. Where the immigrants come from? It's the typical mother of an immigrant into the U.S. And um, she lives in Salitrio, Jalisco, a very small farm. And um, uh, it happens that she has a talent, a very, not a very small talent. She makes the best tacos in the world. <laughs> Absolutely the best. Um, and the secrets of her tacos, one of them is in the corn. This corn is, faces droughts. This corn faces adversity, and thus leads to a, a corn that is low in starch and high in nutrients. She does that naturally. Now she's the mother of immigrants, and then she she shares a taco with you. She doesn't receive you with a hello. She receives you with a, a taco. You know, she's very kind, and so these are the values that we bring, we bring to the mosaic of America. The hard work, the taste of, of, you know, the, of life. She had eight children. And, uh, but mostly we learn from the plant of the maize, you know, which is how the plant faces adversity and how it, 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 it brings it to, to its benefit. So it's, it's uh, um, we, we try to find meaning in people. We try to find uh, hearts. Um, our, question, our answer to the que philosophical question of the why is mostly moments. Find the best moments. It's better that those moments happen than they don't. It's better that these, book, these books exist than they don't. So um, the desire for 
sharing moments. That's what has um, motivated us. Thank you. And I want to move to, to Nina. Um, Nina, I know you have a, a love for the written word, and you talked about journaling. Um, and I know you're also working on your own book. Um, but how did, how did you get into publishing, and have you faced any challenges? Has that inspired you as a writer yourself? That's a heavy question. <laughs> That's a lot. And I'd like to talk, so cut me off if I go too long. <laughs> uh, part of this process of becoming a publisher was actually because I submitted my work, my own manuscript, to be published to two different printing houses. This is the traditional route. <clears throat> and uh, it was rejected. And I didn't get anything, any response back. It was six months or so. And uh, before I got a response. So that was kind of irritating as a writer, and you're so excited about your work. So I thought to myself, well, how, can I, how can I do this on my own? Why, why am I waiting for somebody else to see if my work is worthy? My work is worthy. So I did the research on how to self publish, and um, that, that was years later, though. And then when I read what I submitted to the publishers, <laughs> I know why they rejected me, because <laughs> I made my work back then, compared to the writing I do now, is completely different. So if I could share with you, if you're open to it, about learning about the publishing process, can everybody say yes? Yes! yes. <laughs> so there's three different types of main publishers. One is traditional, where you go get an agent, or you go to a publishing house, and they offer you money up front. Second is a vanity publisher, which you pay them to publish your work. You pay them. And then third is me. I'm kind of a hybrid, so I do both. I prefer to help you. I take an idea from, from an idea all the way to a printing <coughs> and an ebook. I help you develop the process. We do the editing, book cover design, all of that. Everything. One stop shop. I coach you through it. And once you get through one of my coaching sessions, you'll be like, man, I can do this. Yes, you can. So uh, someone posted on Facebook. This is, I tell this story all the time when I appear on podcasts, but someone posted on Facebook five pages of their manuscript, and this is how I got into publishing before I even published my own work. And I've written tons of manuscripts, just never published them. Like the gentleman said, it's like my babies, and I can't let them go yet. But <clears throat> someone posted on Facebook five pages of their manuscript, so I went and the, I, I DM'd him and I said, hey, if you, would, uh, if you want to publish that, I'll, I'll edit the book for you and then I'll publish it for you. You like it? You pay me? You don't like it? You got a book. <laughs> anyway, that's how I got into publishing and we're on our third book now and hopefully we'll get it done by the end of the year. And um, that's how I did it and I've helped several people publish their own work on my website, twofeetpro.com, the number twofeetpro.com. Uh, there's a guide that you can easily do this for yourself. So if you have the ability to write a manuscript, you can also take it to full self-publishing where you can do it all on your own. I can help you through the process and have all the bruises, bumps, and dings of learning that you probably don't, but it's not out of your reach. So I'm on my website, when you open 2freepro.com, scroll to the bottom, you can download a uh, do-it-yourself guide. Nine steps, that's all it takes. Nine steps to publish your own work. Now, hiring people to do all the different things that happen, editing, illustrating, book cover design, might be a challenge, but if you, you're happy. This is, I know all of these things because I do all of these things. I am a graphic designer, I am a writer and an editor, so I have a visual eye a creative mind and a, a, an ability to help you craft your idea to the way that you want it. And with Two Feet Pro, completely, 100%, you get to be your own creative voice. I do not, as Pele said, I do not change your words. I can, I can advise people, and I have advised several authors on changing the way a story flows, or if it's a non-fiction fiction book, the way they outline their story, but at the end of the day, it's yours. You will, you're, gonna, you're gonna stand behind it, 
That's what you do. I had one gentleman that I published from, he's currently incarcerated, and I published his work, and we did this all through email and through his wife. So, and his work was like, I did, I was like, oh my goodness, this needs editing. But I didn't touch it. He said, that's exactly how I want it. I just want you to typeset the book and, and make it ready for print publishing and ebook. I was like, okay. I'm not putting my name on this. <laughs> That's what I said in my head. But what I'm saying is that you have full creative control with 2 Pro. You can do what you want to do. I can advise you, but I would never overstep your creative abilities. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And, and, um, so I have a follow-up for, for the publishers as well. So um, as someone who's writing their story or interested in telling their story, are you guys actively seeking out authors? Do they need to come find you? What has been the greatest success, I guess, for you finding stories to, to publish? What I love the most is the diversity of people that come to me. And I really, I go, I actively do seek people and I always go, oh my gosh, that's a story, you should write a book. I tell that to everybody, and everybody thinks I'm proposition that, but I, I really do think everybody's story is interesting. And we think we're normal people, and, and most, most people that have been on a coaching call with me, I always tell you, being you is 100% your superpower. And that is the story we have to tell everybody. You think it's just normal, day-to-day uh, -day things, but some people think it's so extraordinary what you do, because it's outside of their experience. So... I, um, I'm from Hawaii. I'm Hawaiian and Samoan. My, my dad's Hawaiian, my mom's Samoan. And um, so I am a Pacific Islander. And I, as a person coming up, even though I grew up in Hawaii, there was not a lot of literature that we would study in the public school system with characters that looked like me or came up with the same cultural background. So I always, and I was a book reader, like even when we'd go to the mall, I would go to the mall with my friends and I would lie to them and tell them, oh, I gotta go to the bathroom, but I'll be in the bookstore <laughs> the whole time while they're looking for clothes and going to the record store before the world of downloads, I would be in the bookstore, straight to the bookstore. And when I went with my parents, they knew where I was, so they would come and get me. But there were no stories that with characters like me. So even uh, when I started reading, they put me in a really advanced reading program when I was like in the second grade and the books were like the boxcar children the lion the witch and the wardrobe like these were books that I didn't like I didn't even know what a wardrobe was we don't have wardrobes in Hawaii you know like so some of the cultural context was lost on me and so I wanted to see stories where where kids grew up we went to school without no shoes on and it was perfectly normal and you never see that you, you don't see that in literature or it, it was looked down on for the characters in literature oh you're so poor you don't have shoes but in Hawaii, we just walked around with our shoes. It's just, so those are the stories, and those are the things I want to bring forward when I meet other people. And I, I'm telling you, when I talk to somebody, I will find a story in whatever you're telling me. Oh my gosh, that's an angle. You should write, this, you should write a book. So to answer the question, it's the, diverse, the diversity I love about meeting new authors and hearing everyone's stories and pitching a story idea with it. Does that make sense? Yeah, Walter, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, um, just like she said, it's the diversity. Um, I'm very active on uh, social media, and so when I post about uh, my book, uh, my family history, or sharing information about African American history and South Carolina history, um, I get a thrill when people post back and say, well, my ancestor was enslaved and served in the Civil War, or, or, or uh, was connected to some uh, event in history. Um, and also, that provides me an opportunity to share my ideas, but also learning from them as well. And so <coughs> one thing I've learned as an author, and we all can attest to this, is that, that we are part of a shared community, um, that we are engaging with people all the time. Um, me, as a nonfiction writer, I'm always engaging with historic fiction writers and poets and um, artists, um, visual artists, I have an art collection, um, and so forth. So that's the diversity um, that really has 
empower me is when I share information, um, people respond, and when people respond to me, um, um, I learn as well. And so that's how I build my connections and build relationships. Um, I think for me too in my writing, it's that aha moment. Um, it's that epiphany when you find a story that's never been told. And those of us in the African American community, we know that our history has been hidden so long uh, that um, now it's becoming um, real and relevant. People are now beginning to see that African American history is American history. Um, I always like to make that point because uh, for so long, uh, African American history has been placed as African American history by itself. No, African American history is South Carolina history, it's American history. And so, uh, looking at African American history from my experience, um, I have found relatives who were uh, involved in the Civil War. Um, ironic for me, I'm a descendant of um, a female um, enslaved cook, Lavinia Porter Thompson, um, who was a cook on her, on her master, Sam Webb, on the Confederate side. And then I was able to locate her, um, her state Confederate pension right here in South Carolina. Um, and I found out that she's the only African-American woman in the state of South Carolina to receive a state Confederate pension. Not only I located uh, her pension application, but also her pension payments that she received um, from the county pension board located in her native county, Aiken County. And so when I did my research, uh, I found her name listed, her uh, regiment, and in the book published, uh, and this is the hidden history I'm talking about, uh, South Carolina African American Confederate Pensioners from 1923 to 1925, over 200 African American Confederate Pensioners Many of them were enslaved, some of them were free, received state Confederate pensions. And so when I saw that, oh my God, I got a book here, you know, with the other stories. And so that's my first book, um, which has really opened doors for me to tell the story. I even have a, a presentation focusing on South Carolina African American Confederate pensions, pensions. But also, I want to close in this when you look at research, you don't want to leave any stone um, untouched. Um, even in your germ that you uh, specialize in. Um, I remember when I was about to send my manuscript, my first book uh, for editing, uh, I located uh, our family reunion book, uh, the Thompson family reunion book, which was published in 1987. And I found my enslaved ancestor, who I just mentioned, Lavinia, her uh, narrative that she told to her grandchildren, which was recorded by one of them. And that, um, and I, I just want to summarize it. She was about to be sold to a slave owner in Tallahassee, Florida for $100. Because she was defiant to the slave auctioneer and to her and to her new master, she uh, would have been. And she was beaten so bad, according to her story, that her white dress became bloody. Uh, and when I read that narrative, I mean, I read about uh, Frederick Douglass and uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, their enslaved narratives. But actually reading a slave narrative about your ancestor and her word that was recorded, it, it brought tears in my eyes. So. That's the aha moment that I look for when it comes to African American history and family history. Thank you. We're gonna we're gonna move on to the next question. We're gonna kind of go down the line. We can probably start at the end of with this one. Right. And this question is for everyone. So again, we're gonna start at the end and just then just make our way up. And then right after this, we'll move into questions from the audience. So, in what ways do you hope your writing contributes to broader conversations about identity, diversity, and inclusion in literature? And again, if you will. Uh, my hope is that my writings uh, motivate the, the, the belonging feeling in the mm -hmm. readers uh, as far as they conceptualize the reality that they are living through in, in America and that they find hope and to express themselves. That, 
that that's a great question. I I haven't thought about it um, in my writing, but I I, I would say diversity uh, and inclusion, uh, and there are definitions of diversity and inclusion that are out there. But when I think about my writing, I believe diversity and inclusion are the main themes, uh, because when I look at what I do um, and how I approach. Uh, African American history. I just I look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, I also look at, for instance, uh, we have uh, a rich legacy of agriculture, and in the African American community, uh, we hear uh, negative stereotypes and stories about sharecropping and cotton picking. Okay, we know that sharecroppers in the African American community. Um, and all communities back in those days were taken advantage of. When you think about the, that sharecropper who picked cotton, that sharecropper was part of an industry. Okay, that cotton fiber is what we wear to what we wear today. Our clothes. Okay, we get products from that cotton. Okay, so you think about that. Where I look at the plight of the sharecropper. Um, through my family history and sharecropping experiences, but I also recognize their contributions to the industry, okay, and learning about the cotton industry and how important it was back in the day in South Carolina and still is today. So that's how uh, I incorporate that diversity and that inclusion into uh, my writing. In what ways do you hope your writing contributes to broader conversations about identity, diversity, and inclusion in literature? Uh, we all carry these labels, right? We all say, oh, I'm a woman, I'm a, I'm Pacific Islander, or I'm whatever. We all have labels. I always say I'm everybody's favorite auntie. So, but at the end of the day, what I hope when I write something is that we find the commonalities between us. Um, most times, like, I grew up in Hawaii, and, and part of our Pacific Island culture is that uh, you never know who you're related to. So you always approach somebody with deep respect, right? So you, when you meet somebody, you never know where you're going to meet them again, especially on the little island. So that part, that's part of my identity, and so that, that colors everything that I do, finding that common uh, strings between two people is my first priority whenever I meet someone. So I hope that in my writing that I convey that, that we're all part of the human story and that regardless of our labels, regardless of what we take on as our labels, we are all human and we all have the human condition that we share. We all have different experiences and stories, but at the end of the day, we're all humans on this planet. And so that first, that we all connect as humans before anything else, before any other labels. And that is what I hope I convey in my writing. And um, yeah, that's that. <laughs> okay, so with identity, diversity, and inclusion for me, I can only pray and hope that my writing will be you know, able to help others, inspire others to know, you know, and believe in themselves, you know, know who you are, you know, own your story, because nobody can tell your story better than you do, you know, and so when you own that story, and you get to tell your story, it's your story, and that's what I just want to, you know, um, hope that everyone will be able to tell their story in their own ways, and just to know that, hey, I can do it, if we can do it, you know, you can do it too. And I want to, you know, inspire others to know that, hey, you know, embrace your journey. And just to know that, you know, there's an inner warrior within each one of us. And so you can do it, you know, tell your story. And I encourage each and every one of you in here, you know, we have uh, amazing publishers, you know, illustrators, you know, illustrators, authors, we are all here you know, for you, you all can reach out to any one of us. And, you know, we are willing, I know they are willing because I am willing to, you know, to help anyone who wants to, you know, write their book and tell their story. And I'm so grateful, you know, to the South Carolina Commission on Minority Affairs and the team 
you know, for this amazing opportunity. And when, whenever I get to to thank people, you know, I get emotional because that's just how grateful I am for the opportunity that God has placed in my life. And I'm just so grateful to be here. So yeah, that's that's my hope with identity, diversity, and inclusion, you know, with my writing. Thank you. I think all of us can agree that we are here to make a major impact on the neighborhood. And the one thing that I would tell people that I will leave is do not lose your voice. You know, identify that and hold strong onto it. And if breaking down those barriers, do it. If that's what it takes. And always, always realize that no matter what anyone tells you, you have a voice. And your voice is to make sure that you make happen what you want to make happen. And don't settle for anything less. <coughs> no two people's stories are exactly the same, which is exactly what diversity means. Um, I can sit here with a person who looks very similar to me from the same tribe, um, with very similar family breakdowns, and we would still have two very different stories. And I think that um, is exactly why, uh, whether you write for yourself, whether you write for your community, whether you write because you want to have fun, like you know, I think a lot can be a lot can be said about just like writing for the joy of writing and the joy of discovery. Um, and I think um, that's where I write from, um, is like um, trying to figure things out. Like, I, I'm talking for a volume right now. I hate talking. <laughs> so that's, that's why I write. Um, and I think, um, I think uh, to, to all these folks' point, like, um, no matter who you write your story for, I think putting pen to paper or typing or however you want to put it in the world, like, um, that is exactly, you know, it, it helps you process, it helps you move through the world, um, and sometimes hearing yourself tell your own story is, is the best kind of self-discovery there is. Um, so, a little bit of, yeah. Um, as for me, I always wanted to create diverse characters, so all of my books have diverse characters because I want those characters to look like individuals that I didn't see growing up. Uh, with those diverse characters, I am looking to inspire those um, who didn't see that when they were growing up. Um, also, every book that I create, I have some type of positive message. I want them to believe in themselves and know that they are able to do great things despite how they look, um, despite if they have a disability, whatever it may be. I wanted to inspire and continue to inspire. So I'm hoping that all the books that I create, all of the literature that I put out, all of the illustrations that I create will continue to inspire um, those who are uh, coming on. Thank you. I think Kelly wanted to make one more comment, and then we're going to open it up to some questions. Yes, I just want y'all to remember this acronym, FLY. First, love yourself. Let me hear you say FLY. FLY. Yes, so first, love yourself. you got to love yourself enough to be that change you want to see in life and be that owner of that story, that book. I know come next year, we're going to have an annual one, right? We're going to have a lot of authors up in here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, so we want to open it up to some questions. Does anyone want to start off? Thank you all for holding this. Like you are giving me courage to write my own. But I'm here on behalf of my daughter. Of course, she's got to be in school, right? But I can identify with each and every one of you. And I really commend you. And thank you for joining us today. Because me like you, I had to learn on my own too. I ran into a lot of gatekeepers. So thank you again for this event. Because now when I go pick my daughter up, we're going to go have a seat. And I'm going over everything where it hurt. Because I ran into barriers against the gatekeepers. So we are here, so I'm opening another elevate. So my question is, what's your take on Grant, those um, ghost writers they're called? Because my daughter gets what's called writer's block. So she found an article about something called ghost writers. And I haven't really looked into it totally. So what did you take about ghost writers? Is that, oh. <laughs> 
I started out ghostwriting. That's how I actually got into writing and thinking that I could do it myself. I've done put together reports for or put to, together a comprehensive history for historical places in Hawaii. And I've also written help uh, entrepreneurs write their book. So a ghostwriter writes the book for the person. That's you can do a collaboration. So certain authors I work with now, or they're not even authors, I'm an author. But <laughs> they'll tell me a story. They send me a voice message, several voice messages telling the story that they want incorporated into a book. And then I weave it together in the way that a writer does. And then we publish it. I don't take, a ghostwriter never takes any credit for it. It's contractually, I can't say who I wrote for, or you know, because we contractually agree that they wrote the book. Unless I do, and it'll say so and so, written by so and so with Nina Love. But most times, I don't even want credit. I love to write and I love to help people become the best storyteller they can be. Because some people can have the gift of gas and be in front of a, an audience and just give it to the audience and can't write. Fortunately, I can do both, so <laughs> so I can help people. I help entrepreneurs when most most entrepreneurs that come to me that need their story told are great at this, but can't write. So I create the books that they sell when they go to a speaking engagement and they have their products. I help them develop their logo. Our our team helps with social media marketing, and we do everything with them. And uh, so ghostwriting is somebody that writes for the person. Yeah. yeah so my take on that, I initiate uh, initially when I um, thought of writing my book, I wanted a ghostwriter, but then I had to pray and fast about it. Me personally, I encourage you not to. That's me. And the reason why I didn't want anybody else to write to be a ghostwriter for me because. You know, it's work, and I wanted it to be my work. And I just encourage you, you can do it. Your daughter can do it, and there's help here. And you don't need a ghostwriter to, to write it. And it's more um, it's more meaningful, you know, um, when you write, you know, your own story. Yeah, yeah um, I, oh, sorry, I'm just the, <laughs> um, um, so uh, I don't have a perspective on ghostwriters because that's just a tool you can use if you want it. But you talked about writer's block too, um, and one thing that I do, like you know, you're not always in the mood to create. So my advice typically is uh, find a work of art, or whether it be a poem or a story or a book that you love. And this was advice given to me by one of my writing mentors. Uh, you literally just write it out word for word. Open up the book or the file or whatever it is. Open up your word processor or get your little typewriter out, whatever you use, or use you know, your hands, and just write it out word for word because writing is a craft that is about uh, connecting to other people's stories. And if you can't connect to your own, and if you're not in the mood to process your own, you will find parts of other people's stories that stir you to write your own. Um, and I think. That exercise, um, very simple, but I've I've never run into a moment where, you know, writing a story by Melanie Ray Tone word for word hasn't made me want to, you know, do something up for myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then can I pass this? Oh, oh yeah, I'll pass okay. it. Okay. Thank you. And first of all, I need to ask the um, illustrator. Yes. Um, did you ever find that book? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to buy the book to find it. Um, I had a, a question about the price of publication from start to finish. Um, over the years, I've worked in education, but Kelly knows she's already been privy to one of my first um, creations. and. Um, I believe she had a wonderful emotional um, result of hearing the story and experiencing the story. Um, I tend to write about animals because I grew up with animals. My dad always provided us with animals, and they take on the characteristics, and, and they 
they sh share what I need to say and um, they give messages that anyone can learn from. So I really connected with you as love, connected with everyone on the panel, but I believe that you could probably help me in the direction I'm going. So I would like to know if there are any grants that may be available and how do we actually go about with the publication process from start to finish right now. Thank you. Okay, there are tons of grants. Uh, like this gentleman, he does a grant for, with the arts. So there are tons of grants and there are tons of grants for women of color. And um, yeah, <laughs> before I became a publisher full time, I worked for the University of South Carolina as a grant writer. <laughs> I have a very diverse resume. I, my degree is actually, my bachelor's is in philosophy. I thought I would be an English major, but I, I was like, I don't like the English language. My English broke. <laughs> so it's not the structure of the language, but the conveyance of my emotion and thought through word. Anyway, so the publishing, you just need to uh, submit it to copyright and you need an ISDN. Sometimes if you do an ebook, KDP gives you an ISBN for free. But one ISBN runs about 150, I believe, or 100, anyway, on poker.com. All of this is on my download on 2dpro.com. Uh, so that's about 150. The copyright cost is 200. That's it. If you can do the rest, design the book cover, edit the book, write it. You do the rest, it only costs you $300 tops to publish your book. That's it. It is not that hard, people. And I tell you, I give free game all day. If you ask me to do it, though, I'm going to charge you. <laughs> but I give you free game all day. You can call me, hit me on social media. I'm very active on Facebook at love, L-O-V-E, Nina, N-E-E-N-A. L-O-V-E, at love, Nina, love. So that's it, $300. Now, if you're gonna hire an editor, it gets pricey. Hire somebody who types it, it gets pricey. Hire a graphic designer for the book cover, it gets pricey. And these are all services I do offer, and I offer a complete package as well. So, but if you need help, a free game all day, like I said, hit me up on Facebook. Can you give your um, address again? At love, mm -hmm. Nina, love. If you want to email me, it's Nina, N-E-E-N-A, at NinaLove.com. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You can also, if you're going to publish several books, you can also buy the uh, ISBNs in bulk. And so it's not, you're not going to be paying $150 for one. So you can buy them in bulk. So I think you can buy them at 10 at a time or 100 So you can, so if you're going to be publishing multiple versions of your book, then you can also buy it in bulk. So you can kind of save a little bit of money. That way as well. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to concur uh, with what's been, uh, been said. Um, you can also go to the South Carolina uh, Writers Association. Um, it's the largest association of authors in South Carolina. Um, they also uh, announce grants as well. Um, the South Carolina uh, Writers Association. I don't know their website. Uh, but you could Google the South Carolina uh, Writers Association. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Al Wish Williams. So, first and foremost, I do want to thank you all for really sharing information because, uh, similar to what's been said several times, uh, so I've written several books, not some this year, but there's a lot of gatekeepers from business to writing, whatever it is good at something that we don't like to share. As a matter of fact, my writing is to share because everything that I've written, I give away free resources in the back, but just not published it yet. So one question and a comment back to uh, the uh, copyright and so forth. So I found a way to get a copyright in 65 of all in one through the Library of Congress. You just submit all of your publication, not published in one book. Uh, upload everything together, and it's about sixty-five dollars through the Library of Congress. So that's a free day. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
and then Fiverr is another resource along the way. She shares up here to help with a lot of different um, parts you want to meet. Going back to what one said, that requires that to be my family and what I want to do. So I just outsource what I don't want to do because I don't have the time. I rather really spend that time with my family. But to you all, my question goes around um, marketing. Uh, and so that's where I seem to have a block. Uh, it's how do you truly market to scale and get the result of what you would like? Because obviously, publishing is not necessarily going to make you rich and make a million plus overnight, and that's not an easy case. So, how does marketing work? What challenges have you all had with marketing? What are your recommendations? Um, for me, I mean, it's mostly the social media um, platforms. Um, I contact all the libraries and the communities, different communities. I've had several different um, book signings and public book signings and people in there doing networking. I uh, also work with the Chamber of Commerce in my community. That's another good way. They also help market it, their books and, and everything like that. And when you go out to these events, I mean, you, you have the people out there who's looking for the same thing you are to help promote you in whatever that you're doing, whether it's writing a book or marketing or, or any case. Um, by me doing that, it has opened also with the PD Coalition, and that is speaking and educating men, women, boys, and girls on different things in life, and by me being the author, I had to actually open that door. Uh, one of the dreams that I had, it is to, you know, counsel people, um, to to motivate them, you know, to coach them, and, and I thank God for that, by going to all of these events that the Chairman Commons put on, and they put on hundreds of events every year. And I think there's only been two that I've missed, and it's only because I was ill. But I'm always there, and I'm always passing out my card, and I'm always networking. And one thing, there's nothing wrong with having your card and your phone is blank. I'm just old-fashioned. I like to have the card, because I want, when you look at it, I want you to remember that, okay, this girl gives up here mild in the night. And, and normally when you're scanning someone's card in your phone, I'm not saying, and I don't down that, but I just believe that, you know, you're passing out these cards. People that have something that they're going to look at. Is to be okay. Well, I'm gonna look at this card. I'm, I'm gonna do something with it. But to get in contact with your chamber of commerce in your community, you'd be surprised at all the elevations and the things that they can help you with. So marketing for me is um, networking, like um, Ms. Green said, uh, volunteer uh, for all these uh, events that you have in your community, social media, of course, and. Um, if I post uh, on Facebook and someone, you know, comment and stuff like that, and then I'll just say sometimes I'll be like, hey, you know, DM me the word warrior, and whoever, like the first five people that would DM me, I would share them, you know, I would send them a copy of my book because they took their time to, you know, to DM me. And so, yeah, your network is your net worth. So, you know, when you have that, you know, networking going, you'll be able to, you know, be good with marketing. The uh, marketing for, I tell authors all the time that come to me, I say, you're not going to get rich off of book sales. <laughs> unless you're really, like uh, the gentleman said, unless you're going to sell overnight a million copies, you're not going to get rich from book sales. So there are companion businesses that you can create to help push the book, which for instance, I help entrepreneurs because they're, they're speakers. And so they appear at many speaking gigs. So one, I'll tell you, you get in front of an audience. So social media presence, branding yourself, and then uh, so get in on other people's stages, which is in the form of an actual stage or podcast, all these things, or a panel like this where you become an expert, so to speak, of whatever it is you write about. So that's the marketing angle we take at Tupi Pro. Um. I think you, you have to be open-minded to your marketing strategies. Um, I come from a sales background in the insurance business. Uh, my father and my uncles who sell cars, so they kind of share some tips along the way. So prospecting is, is, is nothing new to me, but we all can um, do it. Um, networking, social media, knowing where your readers are. Um, me, um, I love history, arts, and humanities. So I'm hanging out at the art galleries, they have events, 
I'm hanging out at the museum, volunteering. Um, I'm uh, a member of several um, organizations in the humanities. And you, and you want to be careful with that too, because you don't want to spread, spread yourself out too thin. And you know, we talk about family, like Juan mentioned, and, and you mentioned, um, you got to balance that. Okay, until we got a wife and I got two boys. <laughs> and so she said, you all, you all over the place. So you got to manage that. That got to be a part of, of your business plan. Um, and that's why I would recommend for authors to write a business plan, which would include um, marketing strategies. But knowing your readers, uh, because um, you'll find out that, that you, you're not going to appease to everybody. Okay, and that's okay. Okay, you're not gonna, we all wanna make a lot of money in what we're doing, but you gotta be comfortable in where you are. Okay, and that's why we've been stressing here this morning about that belief system. I mean, that why has to be bigger than you. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you look at um, your, your marketing, you gotta ask yourself, why I'm going to this networking event? You know, what I'm getting out of this? Why I'm meeting with this person? Like Juan mentioned, you, 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 you know, time is money, but time today is opportunity. And you don't want to waste opportunity, okay? And in particular, you don't want to waste time when you don't see any opportunity to come out of it, okay? Um, so that is my um, advice. I would also recommend that you um, do a SWOT analysis. Um, I love these tools. I was in grad school. Um, we dealt with these tools just to get a grade. But now when you look at those tools and you practice them, um, you realize, okay, these tools work. Well, a flawed analysis, your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities and threats, and you can Google it. And that is a starting point because once you know your spot analysis, which includes your marketing, then you can use the information in that SWOT analysis to create action plans. It could be bullets, okay, like marketing, all right? I may need to um, uh, create a social media page, okay? I may need to uh, consult with others to do X, Y, Z, and D. That SWOT analysis would get you going. Um, just want to close to, uh, there's a website that I would recommend everyone um, to check out, it's called the Independent Author Network. Um, the Independent Author Network, and uh, the website address is www.independentauthornetwork.com. www.independentauthornetwork.com. And here's why I recommend that because that network has. Uh, massive resources for authors. Um, there's a membership, there's levels of membership, but you want to get the platinum plan. And the platinum plan right now, last time I checked, um, for, for yearly membership is $99, $99. And guess what it comes with? Upon request, okay, you, you'll get the, the marketing of your books but you will have access, a database, to over 900 bookstores across the United States that you can market to yourself. 900, right here in South Carolina, there's some on that list, okay? 900 bookstores, a radio um, station that interviews self-published authors, okay? Podcasts, you got an array of, of services with the platinum plan, and it's only $99. So take advantage of that, uh, and that could also help you with your uh, marketing and promotional efforts as well. Thank you. Marketing is um, um, exciting, exciting because it brings a lot of possibilities. I would recommend uh, not to be, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm still in the process of marketing my product uh, as well. Um, but I have an idea, you know, because my market, I'd like to get this book, uh, you know, to be read by moms, for example. Moms, uh, by cultural or any mom, and youth. So um, I've been thinking about, you know, a lot about Mexican grocery stores. 
why do we get uh, to get um, you know a key, um, two pounds of sugar, but we cannot get a book? Uh, why can't we get potatoes, but don't get a book? So there's 10,000 or more grocery stores in the US. I wonder if I can make just one sale of one book a week. So that would be 50, that would be close to 50,000 books a year. If I make $2 on, on each book, that would be $100,000. I mean, the marketing is exciting. It can get really exciting. Yeah, and hopefully, it can pay our bills and totally dedicate more time. But um, a creativity and the usual, uh, you know, I don't think that I will cater for Barnes & Noble because my market usually doesn't go there. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd be wasting my time. It'd be loose to me. But, um, uh, you know, there is room for, for innovation marketing-wise. So there is a free resource through the uh, South Carolina Small Business Administration. It's called SCORE. So with SCORE, they'll provide you with mentors. So how he was talking about the SWOT analysis, the marketing, the business plan. So they'll give you insight about how you can create a business plan, how you can do a SWOT analysis. So that's a great resource that you all can um, leverage as well. Um, and they have scores. So they do have virtual presentations. Like I think like every week they have something that they're talking about, whether it's marketing, um, whether it's doing research, finding your uh, um, audience. So that's a great resource that you all can take advantage of. I know I've taken advantage of that. And it took me a while to find it. So if I can share that with you all, now you all know it. So hopefully you all take advantage of that as well. Okay, good. <laughs> Yes, yes ma'am. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Good morning. And again, thank you for this awesome opportunity. I, this is going to sound like a shameless plug, and it is. Okay. <laughs> but then it leads into my question, sincerely. So, I published, self published, January. Um, Mr. P did it, overcoming the literacy. The story of a man, JTK, South Carolinian National for, um, Literacy Advocate, that I interviewed y'all 30 plus years ago. He's since deceased, but I told him 30 plus, 25 plus years ago that I'm going to write your story. So fast forward 28 years later, did the story, um, children's book, wonderful, wonderful book, of course, because you have to believe in what you do. Here is my question to you. Someone recently said to me, so Sabrina, how are you getting it out there? Marketing. What I'm realizing though is that, believe it or not, I'm kind of shy. So I'm not real comfortable with this whole networking, because again, I think it's great. So my question is, have you been in that place, especially with your first book, and that you've been kind of like, oh, I'm, I don't want to put myself out there. Because I, and how do you overcome that, if that makes sense? So my thing is, if you don't believe in yourself, then why would someone else believe in you? Right. So I think that's the first step. Um, I had to overcome, you know, being able to speak in front of people, and now I did, and I don't mind. I'm like, because you have to be your authentic self. And if you're doing that, and I think that that will draw people into you, and that's how you'll get it. And you can start slow as well. Um, one of the great resources is YouTube. YouTube is also free. You can go on to YouTube and create a channel. You don't even have to show yourself, but you can probably read excerpts from your book. Um, you can do a flip through. There are so many different free tools that you can use in order to do that flip through of your book where you can, once again, you can show yourself or you can uh, introduce your book, but not showing yourself. And then eventually, as you get that engagement from other individuals and they're encouraging you as well, that might promote you or encourage you to get out there and show yourself. I said, be the best version of yourself, get out there because I didn't think that people would accept me for who I am with my stuff, but I was like, I gotta believe in myself. If I don't believe in myself, then no one else will. So once I got out there and people got to see who I really was, they was just like, okay, I really, I really believe in what you're doing and how can I help you? So the more that you get out there and you believe in yourself, the more that others will believe in you. Yes, and I just, um, I would say to step out of your comfort zone, and you, you can do it. So I just encourage you to step into your greatness, right? That's what you have to do, because you have so much greatness in you. And so when you step into your greatness, I want you to own that greatness. Own your greatness with faith. Own it with confidence. Own it with joy. But all in all, because I, I love love, 
you know, own that greatness with so much love. And like like um, Sister here said, you know, believe in yourself. That's that's the main thing. And you know, be authentically you. I always say I am free to be the authentic and beautiful me God created me to be, and He did the same for you. But also, you can collaborate with somebody who who is better at sales. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of there's a lot, a lot of people that are really good at sales, that are really really amazing. And uh, what what you can do is cut a deal. Okay, my book costs this much. Okay, I'll give you ten percent, fifteen percent, twenty percent, and and you do the sales. Um, if you you feel you're weak on some area, don't give up. Just uh, Get the word out there, like you're doing right now, with sincerity, I need this kind of help. And there will be somebody out there say, you know what, maybe I can help you, we just cut a deal. You know? Are you for hire? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm not, no. <laughs> yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Tasha Moffat. I am a publisher and from San Antonio, Texas, so I live between here and San Antonio, but I'm also an attorney. I'm a federal prosecutor, so I just wanted to um, thank you. I think this is just absolutely amazing because I think those of us that are in the literary arts, oftentimes we can never find our tribe. And as a military spouse, I have a lot of tribes everywhere. So one of the things that I wanted to at least impact, that is so important. There are so many Charlottes that are out here. Yes. And as an attorney, I implore everyone to make sure your contracts are sound. Make sure that, that the people that will make you have this holy those feeling because they take advantage of people that are so excited to get their works out there. And the other thing with regards to marketing, we've been very, very successful contacting local colleges and universities. We have one author, George Bourbon, um, Iceman, MBA grade. Send your materials to colleges and universities. Many colleges have a required reading. Um, North Carolina A&T, they have about 3,700 freshmen coming in. They have to pick five books a year. So those are little things like that. The other thing, barbershops. We have one of our authors that all he does, he goes from barbershop to barbershop all over the country. Um, hair salons. And for our brothers and sisters in the Hispanic community, one of the things that we do with Prosperity Publications, we partner with Gemini 8 which is Native American and Hispanic owned grocery store. So we have book signings there. There are NAACP image awards. There's national, you have your Divine Nine organizations. You have your church organization. If you're United Methodist, guess what? Every summer, they're gonna have a big, huge convention with 50 to 60 people. And if you can't afford a booth, partner with someone else. But I think that um, what I see here today, this is absolutely incredible. This is amazing, and we're kind of trying to duplicate our team. So I already see some illustrators that I will have to call, some people that I'm going to be looking to try to talk to you guys for hiring. But I think that um, if we work together, and I think the sister here said your network is your net worth, um, look outside of South Carolina. The LA Book Festival, I'm there every year. They are always looking for people. I have two authors that are actually been nominated for NAACP Image Awards. So looking at your Hayward Technical Center, looking at your schools, how can I get involved and get younger people writing? You will not only sell your products, but you will meet new friends and new acquaintances. So I'm just happy to be here. My flight was delayed this morning, but I'm very glad that I'm here. And I have to speak over at Allen University in a little bit, so I'm going to have to move out a little bit. So thank you. Thank you to everybody on the panel who spoke on their experience today. My name is Taylor Simon. Um, I am the owner of an opening bookstore called Liberation is Lit, um, and it's local to Columbia. Um, I am personally very connected to storytelling, so I'm really connected to what everybody was saying about how they use their stories to really connect to readers, to um, empower people through their own personal stories or sharing the stories of others for learning and connection. Um, the mission of Liberation is Lit is to spark community change and action um, and just connection through the power of intersectional stories. So we specialize in selling books by Black, Indigenous, people of color, 
um, LGBTQ plus and disabled writers. Um, you really connect to your readers through distribution and what is your relationships to um, independent bookstores? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I have uh, relationships with um, several independent bookstores. Uh, right here in Columbia, uh, the bookstore on Harden Street, the All Good Bookstore, um, they are um, self-publisher friendly. Um, in fact, I walked in there one day um, and talked to the owner. The owner said, hey, you want to do a book signing here? And, and I said, yes. And so um, um, here in Columbia, All Good Bookstore, um, in Augusta, um, there's a bookstore um, downtown on Broad Street there um, called the Book Tavern. Uh, the Book Tavern, they have events um, there from time to time. Um, but, and that, but, but when you go to these bookstores, um, you definitely want to bring your book. Um, you know, you want to be enthusiastic about your book, and you really want to um, sell the idea um, that your book can be a fit for that particular bookstore. Um, so that would be my uh, advice. Um, as far as um, distribution, um, I'm through Amazon um, KDP. Most of us are through Amazon KDP. And so uh, that's my main distributor. Um, and they also distribute to um, libraries too. Um, and so libraries are, are good distributors um, as well. So I encourage you to build relationship um, not only with your local library, um, but libraries across South Carolina. You go to South Carolina Library Association, um, there's um, tons of libraries that will pull up and you can connect um, as well. Um, but also the distribution, you, you, you also want to be careful too um, because there's a cost uh, when you print your book through Amazon, okay? And that cost is dependent upon um, the, the color of your book. Um, black and white copies are cheaper. Um, color copies are very expensive. Um, so when you, for instance, my second book um, is all color. Okay, and I pay about $12 uh, per copy. Um, I'm gonna try to get lower than that, but I can only afford 20 books at a time. Um, that's you know, 12 times 200. Okay, so you wanna kind of manage um, your distribution um, by looking at the cost, how much it, it will cost for your book to be printed and then selling your book um, as well. <coughs> I really love independent bookstores. <laughs> In fact, when I when I travel outside of uh, South Carolina, I go. We usually stop at independent bookstores, used bookstores, just because there's lots of things that are out of print that you can find there. So I love a good independent bookstore. In uh, one of my trips into Seattle, there were actually there's a it was on in Pikes Market, and there was a bookstore there. And half of the books that were in there were published books without a copyright because they were part of a movement of uh, people that didn't believe in the federal government system. So I thought that was, wow, that opened up my eyes to a whole new world. So uh, just as the gentleman said about uh, doing your books through Amazon, it is a high cost, but I've helped uh, clients print their books outside using an online uh, distributor outside of KDP and still have it available on KDP. Uh, there are different ways in which you can stock Amazon with your own work. So if you go, and the higher you order the number of books from an outside printer, the lower the cost becomes. So the color is expensive on Amazon, but you can also seek out other printers to uh, print out your book. And I've helped people with that, especially Amazon is not as diverse as a regular print shop, which can do spiral binding, wire spiral binding, and whatever the, the, the author wants and their creative vision. 
I try to get them the best price um, instead of having to pay. And usually Amazon is actually really cheap, inexpensive uh, to purchase limited amount of book for one to a thousand books. It's relatively inexpensive. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Demetrius Smith. Um, I go by Flight. I'm also an uh, um, author and publisher and a coach author. Um, a question for you, but a couple of comments. One, to um, Commission Minority Affairs and everybody up here, thank y'all for doing this. This is awesome. The positivity, the energy. I came through the hard knocks way of being taken advantage of. Um, and so to, to see this is a, is a, a beautiful and awesome thing. Um, just a couple of things to, to, to throw out. I'm, I'm by no means a copyright lawyer, but so you know, in the spirit of how the law goes, upon creation, what you create is already copyrighted to you. All right, so whenever you have something that you're going to display, like I could write something right now, that circle with that C, I put on it, that, that is legit. It's copyrighted to me, I just created. Now, for the federal legal protection, you go ahead and go to the Library of Congress and get, get registered, but the moment you create something, if you're gonna make it, I want my friend to look at it, whoever, you go ahead and put your notice on there. Um, that's how the spirit of, of that law goes. The price piece someone asked about, $300 all the way to $10,000, right? Part of it is, when I tell people, um, one, one, of course, actually is your budget, and then two is your purpose. Uh, he talked about writing for the love of writing, right? If I want to see what's in my head on print, I may not need to get all of the other stuff done. I just, I just proved to myself I did this thing I said I was going to do, right? Um, now, if I got an idea that I'm going to get out and make all kind of money on this, there, there's a reason why people pay thousands of dollars um, to get stuff published when you bring in all of those professional services. Um, besides help folks, I can tell you for free how to do it for $300. I can do it for you, it's gonna be thousands of dollars. I work every cent, but it just depends on what you wanna, what you know, what you, what you wanna uh, do with it. Because to like your marketing thing, like you can go to a fast food place and get a hamburger for two dollars. Used to be ninety nine cents, but I don't think nobody's doing it anymore. You can you can get it for two dollars now, right? Um, or you can go to a sit down place and get a hamburger for twenty dollars, yeah. right? Or the grocery store will sell you a pack for ten dollars. You go and cook it yourself. Now that two dollar burger, the packs of ten, or that twenty dollar at the sit down place is all a burger. You gonna still you are gonna not be hungry, but they all serve a different purpose, right? So understanding there's one thing you have a book as your baby Ooh, right there's another thing you have a book as a product right my my baby i'm holding on to real real tight and it's just, it's just personal it's just my kid. but if i'm trying to get people to the part with money oh it's great that you wrote a book it's great that you feel good about it i'm proud of you. you want my money what's your book going to do for me Right, so yeah, switch that to that more of the, the, the business things they talk about with score. What, what does this product do? Um, a ten dollar, ten dollars for twenty burgers from the grocery store don't do me any good if I got to go to work. So that's why I got to go get a two dollar burger. You, you see what I'm saying? So it just kind of depends on that. And for probably record yourself talking. Record one of the issues people have when they go to write a book is they try to write a book. <laughs> and forget that you, you're, you're dealing with a story, all right? We, we can talk all day. So talk, record yourself, talk, record yourself. Then we get a chance to go back and write out what you recorded. Um, and and that will help you, you know, tickle that writer's block piece. And then the other thing you want to say, tickle me purple. You have a color in the book, right? Yes, sir. All right, see, I remember that name, tickle me purple. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you. Um, I got your coloring book a couple of years back. I didn't, I didn't remember your name, but I remember the, the tickle me purple. Right? I got your coloring book a couple of years back. 
And when I looked at it, I said, I said I'm not going to give this to my daughter now because I wanted her to be old enough to appreciate what you put in that. And so it sat on my shelf for like three or four years. And I gave it to her last year. And she could appreciate it. And it made a, a, a big impact. Um, so I, I wanted to tell you What you put in that, what, you, what, what you're doing, um, yeah. And that's why I do what I do, because uh, parents who come and they tell me, hey, this this looked like my daughter. My daughter was being bullied in school. Um, my daughter's, you know, having issues with her self-esteem, or even my son. And then I gave them this book, and it had characters that looked like them. And and I'm pouring into them. We're doing this every night. I'm reading this book with them. or I'm do, They're coloring in this book, and they're not even realizing that is pouring into them and they, they have that positive affirmation. So thank you for sharing it matters. Yes, it matters. thank you. Good morning, good morning. I'm Yolanda. Hi, everybody. I just had a quick question. Do people use pen names anymore? And what does the panel think about pen names? Because let's just say you want to tell the story. It is your story to tell. But you do something in your day life that you don't want anybody to know that you told the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, can, I can say this. Uh, the first author that I came across with a pen name was Belle Hooks. Um, and I, I saw her name, and she wrote her name in lowercase letters. Um, and so um, it's interesting. Um, I mean, I don't see any issue um, with pen names. Because even uh, my counterparts in the music industry, they have quote unquote pen names like Jay Z is Homer, yeah. um, like Biggie, you know, Notorious B.I.G. Um, and sometimes artists use pen names to uh, diss other artists. Um, and, and so I, I think um, it can be helpful um, in many ways, particularly if you're writing stories that. Uh, could be controversial. Um, a pen name could definitely um, suit that purpose. I think a pen name is great because you're taking on a different persona. So whatever, like Stephen King has a different, uh, he writes under a different uh, pseudonym also. So I think it's great. You're stepping to a different persona. If you got tea to spill, it's a great tool. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Thank you all so much for sharing your experiences and your books and your lives with us in this way. My name is Julie Nixon and I am the only AI certified social worker in the United States, possibly the world at this point. I live in Gaston and I provide project-based AI literacy education, projects and books and I call it the book doula system. So I have a few published authors already. My goal is to help people who are in, I don't like the term marginalized, but overlooked communities to learn about AI and how it can benefit us. Using these tools to write faster and keep our intellectual property said all that to ask this question. When people are self-publishing, is it better for them to have an ebook or a hard copy book when they're going to market themselves? I think the least amount of um, buy-in is an ebook. So once you create an ebook, you, uh, down, you can download it to your website or you can add it to a website and you take 100% of the profits. It doesn't need to be sold through Amazon. You could also do that with a print book, but I would suggest an ebook for me. Uh, for me, uh, like, she, like she said, um, you know, Amazon does take a huge chunk of your profit. And so what I uh, did a while back ago 
um, I created payments through Square App, uh, where um, I charge the full retail price, uh, plus shipping and handling. Um, but Square App, um, you could definitely use that. Um, and, and that would be helpful if you have uh, your books already to be shipped out, or um, you have them on you where you could uh, get the money um, if a person has a credit a credit card or a debit card. Um, so yeah, Square App, I mean PayPal um, links, um, I would recommend that because when people buy your book off of Amazon, like she, like she said, um, that Amazon will take a percentage, a large percentage of your commission. Yes, for me is to have a book on hand. So what has worked better for me is, uh, like I said earlier, you know, put a post on Facebook for someone to, you know, DM me the word warrior. And um, somebody bought my book for $100. And so on Amazon is $12.99. But I always encourage people to have a signed copy. So a signed copy for me is $18.99. And so um, I, I prefer having, because you travel with the book. And so wherever, you know, um, whenever you get a book, just travel with it. I don't care where you go. You just got to make sure you have, you know, one or two inside, you know, your car and everything. But um, it's, ebook is good for me too, but I prefer, me personally, I prefer to have, you know, a signed book, you know, and to, you know, share it that way. And so my website is pillarinspired.com and so that's what I share for people you know to reach out to me in order for them to get a signed copy um, I I hesitate to say you know what's better in terms of uh, ebook versus uh, physical copy but to the point of like a lot of what has been said um, so I am publishing it I'm publishing the traditional way and in my contract like I make a larger cut from an ebook because there's less like processing fee. It's like basically a PDF or an ebook. Uh, whereas like a physical copy would cost more. So I, I encourage instead of being like, what's better, be like, A, like have a price differential obviously between a physical and an ebook. And then B, um, determine like, okay, like if you're self publishing, like an app or analyze what is selling more and like um, go from there. Like I don't think either. Yeah, I agree with that as well. But a lot of people in terms like the hard copy or paperback and to have your signature in it, it is something that's going to be more, I won't say of value, but it is more meaningful to me. I mean, I'm not against the ebook process, but to me, I just prefer having a book in hand, you know, just have something that, that means more to me. I prefer a, a, a published book also, but the in terms of automation, uh, digital download, EPUB, uh, PDF, it's automatic. You don't do anything. You put it out there, and the link gets shared, and whoever wants to buy your book, it's an automatic process. You do nothing. You don't send out a book. You don't have to do anything for it. That's why I say ebook. but yeah, I prefer uh, a book. <laughs> okay, we have, we have one more question up front, and then we're going to move on to closing um, comments. Um, just because I'm going to leave like 30 minutes for everyone to kind of like network throughout. Um, I think we have the room till 12. So that gives us a little bit of time for you guys to meet, talk to the, to the authors and to each other. So one last question. Um, Thank you. Very great. So packaging my 10 year old's coloring book. I know when you go into business, you're going to get some notes. So she received her first note from Target Corporation. So I was her mom, asked them why the rejection. It's a coloring book to inspire other kids all across the world that they can be anything that they want to be. So yeah, I answered that. So she got her first no, and the response to me is, we see no value in it. I was like, okay. So what can she do to get her book in all your stores? So they want it to be packaged um, or crayons, or a keychain, something for me. So how can I do that? 
Like, how can I get her calendar book? Because right now she's on Walmart Marketplace and Amazon thus far. So she wants to add that value. She took it sadly, but courageously, okay? So how can we get a package with, um, you know, just don't come and put so much little board free um, crayons or just little fluffy, that kids love little fluffy keychains. So she doesn't want to be like everybody else doing that. So I told her, her homework is to write down five things of value that attach with her coloring book. But how would I even go about getting that package for her? Do you want to offer any of that? Does your book have the template Does anyone have experience? <laughs> I can only speak from an entrepreneurship background rather than a self-publisher, but creativity is actually and begins and ends with you. So whatever you can think of, whether it's going to the dollar store, the dollar tree and saying, hey, we need this much. My daughter is a young entrepreneur, especially children, and we want to package our coloring book with some color crayons and he would like to, I mean, just your creativity is your limit. So. If you can think outside the box, color outside of the line, so to speak, you the answers are whatever you want it to be. That's me speaking as an entrepreneur. I have never packaged anything with publishers, but as an entrepreneur, your creativity is what's gonna drive you. And usually children, especially children who haven't been limited by uh, society, can push the boundaries of their imagination. So I would foster that. I don't have any experience, but I just want to encourage you to know that there's always going to be many no's before you get to that yes. So be prepared for that yes that God is preparing you for. And don't let, you know, other people's opinions, you know, stop you and your daughter from what you are trying to do. And you got help here, so. And then one of the things that you can do, so with those five ideas that, you know, whatever she says she wants to do, um, look for a distributor. Uh, so that's a, a simple Google search. Look for a distributor and say, hey, you know, my daughter, she wants to do whatever he said, like fluffy keychain. So if that's what she says she wants to do, Google, Google is going to be your best friend. Um, Google and say, hey, um, I'm looking for a distributor for X, Y, and Z. And then you can package those um, together. So like you said, I do, I do coloring books as well. So um, that's one of the ways that you can um, do that too. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, just on behalf of the South Carolina Co for Commission for Minority Affairs, we just want to say thank you for volunteering your time and your expertise um, to inspire um, a room full of writers, hopefully, um, for you guys to tell your stories. And thank you to the audience for your participation. Um, we do have a few awards that we'd like to give out to the authors and publishers just as a thank you. Um, hopefully, we're able to have this event again. Um, I think we all can see the value in having um, different faces and groups and representation um, here. So I know Brenton has the awards. We'd love to get a group photo with everybody as well. Um, I think they're in